morning, everyone. Great to be here with all of you. And uh, I think it's for the first time this season, I want to say Merry Christmas. We only have a month to say it, right? So good to see all of you here this morning and uh, good to be worshiping with you. Uh, we're excited uh, about December, we're excited about this series that we're in, and uh, we're leading up to our Christmas weekend, which is coming up uh, December 22nd and 23rd, and then Christmas Eve. And we're really celebrating the fact that, that it's really a Christmas around the world theme, because uh, we know that, that God sent Jesus, his son, uh, because he loved the whole world, and, and that the gospel is for everybody, from every walk of life. And uh, something that really uh, brings joy to my heart is, is that we are a church for everybody, that we uh, are, are just continually being a direct representation of the kingdom of heaven here at Christ Community Church. And uh, it's been fun uh, each week to hear different traditions and uh, different backgrounds of people uh, here in the States and around the uh, world in, in, in how they celebrate Christmas. So I hope you're enjoying these uh, intro videos. We have these, uh, these invites in the seat pocket in front of you. Uh, the weekend, the 22nd and the 23rd, we're going to have four services. And it's, it's the time to start inviting friends and prayerfully thinking about who you could invite. Uh, we're going to have four services, one on Saturday. And on Sunday, we're going to have an 815 service, a 945, uh, and an 1130. Uh, so there's, there's four services that weekend to come to. And this, the weekend is entitled, For God So Loved. And then on Christmas Eve, uh, Pastor Conrad's going to be preaching, and man, boy, he does a great job. I love Pastor Conrad. He's entitled his service, the service Baby Boss. So I know we're in uh, for a treat on Christmas Eve, and I, I know he's got a, a really great message plan. Uh, but invite your friends and take a couple invites, and uh, we have more. So don't feel like you're taking the last one out of the seat, uh, because we can, uh, we'll, we'll resupply that. Uh, as we come into the message this week, uh, our sermon series for December leading up to Christmas is called Expectations. And last week, Greg did a great job talking about all the prophecies in the Old Testament uh, about Jesus and about the coming Messiah. Uh, this week, we're going to take a look at a, a, at a part of the Christmas story in Matthew chapter 1 uh, through the perspective of Joseph, Jesus' um, father here on earth. We know that God is his heavenly father. Uh, but as we look at that, uh, we're going to be considering Joseph's perspective. And Joseph really came to a place in his life, and we see it in the birth narrative here in Matthew chapter 1, where he had to really make a very difficult decision. In fact, he had to make a decision uh, based on a lot of things that he just didn't understand. Uh, that he was presented with a, a, a situation uh, where he found his his engaged uh, bride, uh, to be pregnant. And it wasn't his child. And he came to a place where he had to make a decision. And we're going to look at that here today. I do believe that each one of us, though, can really relate uh, as, as fellow uh, people where Joseph was in this decision that he had to make. We can relate with the fact that often we're faced with things in life, uh, we're faced with circumstances and choices that we, that we have to make in life, uh, areas in life where we come to where we have to trust God beyond our own understanding. And that's where Joseph found himself. And that's the main takeaway of our message here today is, is that Christmas reminds us that we can trust God beyond our own understanding. How many times have you had to trust God in your life oh, and then you weren't really sure about what God was up to or how it was going to work out? You didn't understand all the details or, or the, the, the overarching plan that God had, uh, but then you look back on it and you see that God was at doing his handiwork the entire time. But it really is a faith walk of trusting God one choice and one decision at a time. You know, we have this up-close view of life. We, we're so close to it often we can't see God's overarching plan, but we have the beauty and the benefit of looking at Scripture, and we can see God's overarching plan throughout history and throughout Scripture. And it gives us that, that, that further ability to trust that God does have a plan in and above all things. And we see that in the story of Joseph and the birth of Jesus. So as we go to this time, we're gonna, I'm going to read the passage for you here today, and uh, I'm going to ask that you follow along, and it'll be on the screen. There is a Bible under the seat pocket, uh, under the seat in front of you, if you want to follow along uh, in the Bible. You can pull out your electronic Bible, which if you don't have a Bible app on your smartphone, you should definitely download one. What a great way to have Scripture with you at all times. If you're new to Scripture, 
Uh, we're going to be in the book of Matthew today. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament, and the 66 books of Scripture are broken into two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And if you're new to the Word of God, we want you to know that uh, the, the Bible, the entire book of Scripture, uh, points to Jesus. And the Old Testament uh, talks about creation, and then it talks about the coming of Jesus, and then the New Testament explains the life of Jesus, and then the eventual return of Christ uh, to redeem this world uh, once and for all uh, when he returns. And as we look at Scripture today, we're in the New Testament, in the book of Matthew, and we're going to be in chapter 1, starting in verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. He did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. God, we do believe wholeheartedly and fully uh, that it is inspired by you, uh, that it's written without error, and it's the authority in our life. So God, we ask now that you would speak to us as we dive into your word, God, as we learn this wonderful story, uh, Lord, of Jesus and his great redemption of our lives through the grace, Father, that you've provided. And God, uh, may each one of us have our hearts pierced by your word here today, God. May we take the next step in our faith journey here this morning. God, we dedicate this time to you now. Uh, may this word be edifying to each one of us and honoring to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. So as we begin here, we need a little bit of context to understand the culture and the times uh, of where Joseph and Mary were at. It, it says that... Um, uh, when they think, it says that they were pledged to be married, is what the NIV says. A lot of your translations uses the word betrothed. Now, I don't know how many, raise your hand if you use the word betrothed today in a sentence. I did this morning because we were talking about the different variations of the word betrothed, but uh, it's not a very common English word anymore that we use. But when we think about the culture of the time, the Jewish culture of the time, there was three stages of marriage. The first one was engagement, and it was different than our engagement. Uh, it meant that there was this prearrangement, which often was made between parents of children long before they were of the age to be married, and often they wouldn't even know each other until they were getting closer to the age of marriage. So it was more of an arranged time, and that would be the engagement period. Once they got closer to the age of marriage, they would meet and, and begin to spend time together. Uh, but then when they were at the age to be married, uh, they went into uh, a time uh, of betrothment, that they would be betrothed to one another. And it's important that we understand what betrothed means because it was a legal binding relationship, a covenant, a commitment to one another, uh, and it was, as, um, it was as official as marriage itself. Uh, but what it meant was is that they were committed to one another in marriage, but they were not living together and they had not consummated their relationship physically. And you all know what that means. So on that part of it, this is where we find Joseph and Mary. They were in a legally binding uh, covenant of, of being betrothed together. And so the only way to get out of that was actually by having a divorce. So here's Joseph uh, growing up. Uh, by this time, of course, he knew Mary and, and, and thinking about all the wonderful dreams and thoughts and hopes he had of being in relationship with Mary, of having a family and, and doing all the things that he uh, was thinking about. Here he is and, and, he, and, he, and he finds out one day uh, that now his beautiful bride, his, his beautiful virgin bride is now with child. He comes home one day and she has to say, hey, Joseph, um, I don't know how to tell you this, but I'm pregnant. 
Now, whether we're talking about a Bible story or we're talking about a real story or we're talking about an episode of Jerry Springer, all of those things are still something that we can understand. Would you agree with that? Uh, but the truth is, is that these are things that have happened in, in, in some of our lives even, uh, but we can understand the, the pain. Can you imagine uh, the pain and, and the grief and, and just the, the brokenness that Joseph began to feel in that one moment when he found out his beautiful bride, Mary, who he had all these hopes and dreams for, who he believed to be a virgin, is with a child and it wasn't his. Now on the lighter side, can you imagine what that conversation looked like? Hey, Joseph, you know how I've been kind of sick every morning? Yeah, honey, I, I know how you've been sick every morning. Hey, you know, we, we tried all these different things, and I stopped eating so much flatbread, and I'm trying to figure out what's making me sick every morning. I can't figure it out, you know. Uh, I, couldn't, I, I don't know what the problem is. Or, hey, honey, you notice I've gained a lot of weight. You know, I haven't just been kind of gorging on, on dates uh, more than I should be. Uh, the truth is, is that I'm pregnant. You know, maybe that, you know, we can kind of jump into that conversation that they begin to see signs of pregnancy uh, but then it finally came down to the point that he found out that his bride was with child. But think about that. That conversation, that moment that we, he was in, broken and disheartened. Now the penalty for adultery during that time was actually stoning. That he comes to this place, not only uh, does he have this wonderful bride who he loved, who he was planning on spending his life with, he also knew the outcome of this, uh, this potential sin or adultery that happened in that time was that she would be stoned to death. And we even see that Jesus came upon a woman who was caught in adultery uh, during his ministry, and he saved her from being stoned to death. And many of you know that story. Now, the, the, next, the next level down from that of penalty of adultery would be to be brought before public counsel. It would be to be uh, put to shame and to be cast out from your community. You would be excommunicated from your community. Very similar to the Puritan times when they would put a scarlet letter on a woman and send her out. Uh, that was the next level down. But a thing we need to see in here is the great mercy and love of Joseph. In fact, we can see Christ's likeness in Joseph because of his great love and mercy for Mary. Because what does it say in the passage? That he was faithful to the law and he didn't want to publicly disgrace her. So he had in mind to divorce her quietly. That there was another way to, with just a couple of witnesses, to quietly divorce her and, and move on with his life. But we also see that, that beautiful testimony of his Christ-likeness and his great love for Mary. And we can see that reflected in Christ's story for us. We see something a little bit deeper here, though. When we think about the fact that Joseph had believed that sin had happened, when we, when we consider the fact that, that he thought there was sin that had happened and that was going to lead to a divorce, we can see a big a bigger picture, a bigger gospel message in this Christmas story. If we go back to the beginning in Genesis chapter 3, uh, we see that there was a fall of man that, that Pastor Greg shared about last week. If you missed that message, by the way, I'd encourage you to go online on our website and watch it. But you see that fall of mankind. You see, in the beginning, there was this perfect marriage, this perfect relationship between humankind and God. And then sin happened and a divorce happened. We know that divorce means that there's a separation between two parties, that they're no longer together in relationship, that there's been a severing between those two things, that when sin happened, mankind had been divorced from God for eternity. In fact, even today, if we do not have Christ Jesus in our life, we live our life divorced from the presence of God. And you see, we can see the gospel message right here in this passage as we consider what was happening in Joseph's life, and that this potential sin that happened was going to lead to divorce. Now, all of us in this room have come into contact with the devastating effects of divorce at one point or another. Uh, statistically, if 55% if of marriages in our country end in divorce, it means that everyone in this room in one form or another has been affected by divorce. Whether it's your parents that were divorced, uh, whether it was close friends, or maybe you've gone through a divorce. I know in my own life, uh, my parents uh, were divorced, and I know at one point in my life that my marriage was in a place of some things that I did that could have led to divorce. We know that divorce is painful. We can all kind of enter into that space with Joseph and with Mary. We can begin to kind of understand how they were feeling because of our understanding of the pain that comes with divorce. 
You know, when sin leads to divorce, it's, it's just the truth uh, of divorce. Now, I want to make it clear that the Bible does make some exceptions for biblical divorce in the case of abuse, abandonment, and adultery. Um, but in all those cases, you get to that place, sin led to that place. But God had another plan, didn't he? God had another plan that, that, that over and above that, that, that plan that Joseph had, over and above even what happened with mankind, he had a plan to, to, be, to reunite us in marriage with our one true king. He, he had it in mind to, re, uh, to reconcile that relationship with us. And we see that in this passage. And that as we think about the great divorce that once happened, we think about the fact that we are divorced from God uh, without Jesus, we see further down in the passage, uh, in verse 23, it says, uh, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Uh, so mankind fell, and there was this great divorce between us and God, and, and this, this, this plan that God had through generation after generation uh, to redeem our lives came through God. Christ Jesus, Emmanuel. And, and Joseph would have known all of these prophecies. He would have understood the fact that, that, that has been foretold and prophesied that a, that a God would going to come and was going to reinstate our relationship with him. So as he heard these things, he was being reminded of all that he knew. But God was working out this plan through the faith of Joseph. And that through this one moment, uh, Joseph was presented with these two options. The option to flee and, go and follow his own path and continue through with this divorce or to follow through with God's plan, to follow through with the plan that he didn't quite understand, but he knew that God was telling him the way to go. It's important that we see something else here. Humankind made the choice to do something outside of the will of God and to sin, and, and that separation was caused by us. But the reconciliation is had through the pursuit of God after each one of us. And that God came to be with us. God is Emmanuel. He's God with us. As we think about this story, often I believe that we see it as a story that's out there. We may believe that the story's true. We may believe that, that God is who he says he is. We may even believe in the salvation of Christ Jesus, but it's still somewhat of an out there story. At Christmas time, even, we think about celebrating the birth of Jesus, but I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel a little removed from that story. But the truth is, is that at Christmas, we not only celebrate the birth of Christ Jesus, we celebrate a remarriage of mankind with God. And that when we come to Christmas, we begin to realize, begin to celebrate when we know the whole story, that it's, he is Emmanuel, God with us, that God came home, that we were separated from God through this divorce that sin caused, and, and, and in walks the door at Christmas, God comes back, and he says, I want to I wanna make things right. And I get that you have an inability to make things right, but I'm sending Jesus because he can make it right once and for all. And it's not just two cu a couple trying to work things out. He's, he's washed away all that was wrong in our relationship and made us stand before God holy and pure again. There's a couple that goes to this church, and I didn't ask them ahead of time to share their name, so I'm not going to share it. But uh, boy, when I see their, their, their marriage story, I see the gospel they were married uh, before they were Christians, and they were uh, married for quite a long time, and then they got divorced as non-Christians. And then over the course of about 10 years, they both came to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and God brought them back together, and they were remarried here at our church four or five years ago. And I just think about that beautiful imagery of the, the work that Christ did in their life, that regeneration, that, that new birth that they had in their life, and that, that remarriage in Christ. And now their relationship is totally different. It's, it's founded in Christ. It's in this perfect relationship with God. And now he's at the center of their relationship. And I, I just love that story. I just think it's really powerful, uh, the message that it sends of God's great plan uh, to, to uh, reconcile and to, uh, to bring back, reunite uh, that marriage that we had. But as we think about it being out there, I want to point out one more thing. In the beginning of this interaction with the angel, the greeting that he has for Joseph is really important. He says, Joseph, son of David. 
In your bulletin, I put a few further study notes in there for some passages, and it, it talks about the, the promise to Abraham and the promise to David and then uh, the promise that's fulfilled through Joseph. But when, it, when we think about Christmas as kind of being an out there story, Today, we, we need to learn that we find ourselves in this Christmas narrative, that, that through Jesus Christ, the promise that was made to Abraham, that he was going to be multiplied for generation and generation, the promise that was made through the line of, of David, the same line of Abraham, that his throne would live on for eternity, uh, that we are now children of that promise through Christ Jesus. And at Christmas time, we get to celebrate the fact that now we're part of the family of believers. Think about when your family and friends gather around Christmas time and how good that feels to have that, that great union together. We give gifts and we have our favorite foods and we have all the wonderful things that we love to do together, but there's that real sense of belonging as that we have that togetherness. Sometimes uh, we have family members that we only see at Christmas. They, we travel to them or they travel to us, but we, we get that great sense of family togetherness at that Christmas season. But when we celebrate Christmas as followers of of Christ Jesus, we're celebrating this wonderful union that we have once again with God, that we have been made part of his family. I want to show you a passage in Galatians uh, chapter 3, verses 6 and 9, and the references in your, in your uh, bulletin. I want to read it to you. It says, so also Abraham believed God and, it was, and was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith and are children of Abraham uh, those who have faith are the children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. You see, when we put our faith in Christ Jesus, we're the heir of the same promise that God gave Abraham and David and Joseph, all because of our faith in Christ Jesus. That our, our name, uh, now this won't show up on Ancestry.com, but our name is in that genealogy in heaven of a great heritage of God's people. That your name is now in that, in that list of heirs in the kingdom of heaven because of what Christ did. Now, I don't know about you, but that adds a, a much deeper meaning meaning to why we celebrate Christmas, doesn't it? Uh, that we're not just celebrating the birth of a baby uh, or the, even the birth of baby Jesus. We're celebrating the remarriage of us and God. We're celebrating the fact that we have been included in this great heritage and, and, and kingdom lineage of God himself. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. And how did it all come about? It came about by faith. Abraham's faith did he fully understand what God was telling him? No. How about David's faith? Did he fully understand all that God was telling him? No. You think that Joseph fully understood all that God was telling him? I don't believe so. In fact, I would even argue, and I can't substantiate this through Scripture, but I would argue that him and Mary didn't quite understand the whole Holy Spirit birth thing until they probably got to heaven. How did that actually work? I would, I would think that they didn't quite understand it. But what did they do? Abraham and David and Joseph and everyone in that lineage, what did they do? They trusted God beyond their understanding. And this is what we can apply out of this story of Christmas, that as we look deeper into the story of Christmas, we learn that we can trust God beyond our own understanding. How many things are you facing in life right now that you don't quite understand? We can't see fully choices that we need to make, areas that we need to trust God. We come to these points often where we are in this, in this predicament of whether we flee and, and, and follow our own way or we submit and follow God's way. I believe these choices come up big and small almost every day in our faith journey that we have to make that decision on whether or not we trust God and follow him fully or we flee and follow our own plan. Joseph, when he made that plan, uh, not only did it affect that one moment, not only did it affect and keep his marriage together, but in effect, it, it continued to fulfill that prophecy. It, it had an eternal impact, uh, not only in David's life and in Mary's life and all those lives around us, but his choice all those thousands of years ago is still impacting our lives here today. You see, these faith choices that we make have much bigger implications uh, than just what's right in front of us. God has the fuller picture. 
The faith choice that you make will not only affect you, it's going to affect your family, it's going to affect your workplace and your neighborhood, and it's going to affect generations to come. For generation after generation, the faith choices that we make, just like Joseph's faith choice, will affect many generations to come. And Christmas reminds us, it reminds us that we can trust God beyond our own understanding. So as we wrap up here this morning, when we think about this Christmas story, where do you need to trust God in your life today? What are you facing in life today that you need to trust God fully and wholly, even beyond your own understanding? Some of you here have yet to put your trust in God for the first time. You have yet to trust this gospel story that Jesus came and he is fully God and fully human and that he paid the debt for your sins on the cross and that he was buried for three days and on the third day he rose from the dead by the Holy Spirit. He was born as a baby by the Holy Spirit. He was raised from the dead by the Holy Spirit. And that same Holy Spirit, when we put our faith in Christ Jesus, he comes and dwells inside of us. Those are all steps of faith. Scripture tells us that if we believe with our mouth, I'm sorry, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then we'll be saved. For all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's that step of faith. It's the step of faith that Abraham had and David had and Joseph had and many in the room have taken that step of faith to call Jesus their Lord and Savior. And today, God's calling you to make that faith step in your life to trust God beyond what you can understand. There's so many things uh, that, that, that are hard to f- figure out, but we can trust the fact that God is who he says he is. He'll do what he says he will do, and that he loves you so much that he wants to be reconciled in relationship with you through Christ Jesus. And there's nothing you can do uh, to earn it. There's nothing you could have done to lose it. Uh, Christ is offering it to you for free, and he wants you to make that choice here today. And for others of us here in the room Each and every day, we need to make this choice. I leave you with this one verse, and I really think it sums up Joseph's life, Joseph's time here. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Joseph lived this out as good as anyone that I can see in Scripture. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Let's read that verse together if we can. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. How do you need to trust God today? Is it with your salvation? Is it with where God has you in life? Uh, Maybe you've been resisting God and today you need to just commit to submitting to him. Uh, But let's let Christmas uh, be a celebration of the birth of Jesus and the remarriage with God the Father. And and let's let it remind us continually that, that it reminds us that we can trust God beyond our own understanding.